Hi, everybody. I'm Mrs. Grace Saunders. I'm here um, offering up a prayer for um, this Sunday. Um, first, I'd like to say we miss you guys, and we will be back together soon. Now, right, let's bow our heads and pray. Yahweh, we just love you so much, God. We just thank you for all that you do in our lives. We know that right now, times are tough with um, COVID-19, and we've been separated. But, Father, we know you're in control. You're sovereign that uh, your will will be done. So, um, Father, just give us strength. Remember, we got to be on your strength and your might, not ours. That's the only way we're going to get through this. So, um, be strong in the Lord. And that's how I pray. Amen. Everybody, we miss you. We will be back together soon. And uh, remember, keep praying and keep reading the Word. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's time to recite our memory verse for April. We've been memorizing out of Ephesians 6. So our April verse is, Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm. I hope you all have that. Now we're going to go back to January, February, March, and back to April. So let's start from January. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. Hold on just a minute. It's this darkness. 
against the world forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. If you are not memorizing and if you are not hiding God's word in your heart, you need to start. This is so important. It will change your life. I miss everyone and I hope we get to be together soon and we are going to have the biggest group hug ever. Talk to you later. Good morning, First Baptist Church family. I wanted to take a moment as we finish up our worship on this last Sunday in April just to express my thanks to Tyler for all that he's done, his preaching, teaching, and encouragement as he's been a part of our family here at First Baptist in Jackson. And to remind us all to remember to pray for he and Savannah and little Ezzy as they transition into a new chapter of life as Tyler takes an engineering job in Stockton. So when you see them, Give them a high five, a hug, love them, and uh, I just invite you to pray with me now for them in this transition. Let's pray. Father, I come before you. Thank you so much for Tyler, for Savannah, little Ezzy. As they transition into this new chapter that you have planned for them, we pray for strength, encouragement, blessing on their lives as they continue to follow you, and that they would be salt and light to everyone that they bump elbows with. And we pray this in your powerful name, Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Everybody have a great week. Enjoy the warm weather. Remember, next week we're going to celebrate communion together, so make sure you have some juice and some bread prepared as we enjoy our time of worship then. Enjoy the sunshine this week. Look forward to seeing you again. Remember, stay strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Love you guys.
Well, greetings, everyone. I know if you didn't listen to the, the Sunday School lesson from last week, it might be a little surprising to see me preaching this week rather than Pastor, but as Pastor, um, I think, is going to introduce before this video, um, the reason why I'm preaching this week is because I will be stepping down from preaching and teaching due to the fact that I, by God's grace, got an engineering job in Stockton. I've been looking for an engineering job for a few months and finally got one by His grace. And so it's a blessing to have found this job, especially with all that's going on right now with the economy and so many people applying for unemployment. But at the same time, it's uh, sorrow for me that I won't be able to be able to won't be able to continue preaching and teaching. So I'm excited to be able to do it one last time here. And um, just, I know I had talked about uh, looking for a ministry position somewhere else in the country, or I talked about going to get a doctoral degree and just decided that at this time, the best thing that I can do to serve the Lord and to serve my family is to get an engineering job. So I'm excited to see what the Lord's going to do and how He's going to use me in that way. And just the fact that no matter what we're doing, in all things we're able to serve the Lord and to glorify Him. So, um, so that's it. And... Um, let's pray together, and then we will turn to the book of Hebrews, which is what we're going to be studying this morning. Father, we have sought you today because we long to know you. We know that we live in a dry and weary land in which there is no water, and our desire is to behold your power and your glory. We know that your steadfast love is better than life, and so our lips praise you, and we desire to serve you and to know you in all things. We ask that you would give us grace by your Spirit to behold your glory in the face of your Son. Let us truly see you, Father. We do not want this to just be information, but we want to see the greatness of who you are. So grant us the help that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. So turn with me to the book of Hebrews. We are going to read the first chapter and then the first few verses of chapter 2. Our focus is going to be on Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. But we're going to start in, ver in chapter 1, verse 1, in order to get the context of what we're going to be studying. So Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1, the author writes, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And... You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years have 
no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are, who are to inherit salvation? Therefore, we must pay much, much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So the book of Hebrews was written to a group of Christians who for various reasons were being tempted to turn away from Christ. And so the author of this book wrote this letter to them and to, to encourage them to hold fast to Jesus, not to forsake him, but to cling to him by faith for their entire lives. And the way that he did this was by reminding them of the supremacy of Jesus by showing for them that Jesus is greater than anything this world can offer to us. He's greater than angels, he's greater than Moses, he's greater than the Old Testament, the Old, the old Covenant, and he's greater than anything that we can find in this world. And so in light of that, in light of Jesus' supremacy, in light of Jesus' greatness, he urges the, the audience of this book to cling to Jesus, to hold fast to him, not to forsake him. And in the verses that will be our focus this morning, verses 5 through 9, the author is emphasizing the point that he's been emphasizing in chapter 1, namely that Jesus is greater than angels. And the reason why he's greater than angels he, we read about is because he is God's very Son, the one whom he appointed to be heir of all things, the one through whom he created all things, and the one to whom he has subjected all things. And he says that none of the angels God has said that of. None of the angels has God declared to be his son. None of the angels has God appointed to be heir of all things. And in the section that we're studying, to none of the angels has God subjected the world to come. However, what we're going to see is that there's this paradox that we experience as Christians. Because on the one hand, the author declares that Jesus has had all things subjected to him. But on the other hand, he says, we do not see everything in subjection to him. So in other words, Jesus is in control of absolutely everything. And yet, it often appears to us as if Jesus is not in control. So the question is, how, is, as believers, are we to live with this paradox? How are we to live with the fact that, on the one hand, Jesus is in complete control, all things have been subjected under him, and yet, on the other hand, it often appears as if the world is outside of his control. And what we're going to see is that the author will say, though we do not see everything in subjection to Jesus, we see Jesus. And the question that I want to have ringing in your head, even after this video ends, is have you seen Jesus? Have you beheld Jesus? And in 
wanting you to remember that question, my prayer is not just that you will remember that question, but that that question and our meditations from this video will drive you to the scriptures, will drive you to the Bible, so that by God's grace, you will be able to answer that question every single day with a resounding yes. That every single day, we will be able to say, I have seen Jesus today, and I'm going to live my life today by his grace, because I have beheld his greatness, I have beheld his supremacy. So with that, let's turn to the verses that we will be focusing upon this morning, starting in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5, where the author says this, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. So the word for at the beginning of this verse indicates that the author is connecting these verses with the section that has just come. And as we've said, this section, the first section of the book, his goal is to demonstrate how Jesus is greater than angels. And what he says here in this verse is the way in which Jesus is greater than angels is because it is not to angels that God has subjected the world to come. In other words, the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, heaven for all of eternity has not been placed under the control of angels, but is under the control of Jesus. To demonstrate that, he quotes from Psalm chapter 8, which is in verses 6 through the first part of verse 8. He is quoting from, from that psalm. Now, if you were to go back to that psalm, go back to Psalm 8 and read it in the context, you would see that the, David is speaking of humanity when he says, Hebrews 6, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? In the original context, in Psalm 8, David is clearly referring to man as humanity in general. If you look at the psalm, you'll see he's, he's alluding to Genesis chapter 1, where God created man, male and female, in his own image, and he gave them dominion over all of creation. And that's what David refers to in this psalm. He's amazed at the fact that though God is so great, though he spoke and all came to be, though he commanded and all things stood firm, yet he cares for humanity, these lowly creatures. And he's cared for them so much that he placed them in charge of all of creation. That's what David was referring to there. And yet here in Hebrews, the author seems to be applying this psalm directly to Jesus. So the question is, how does the author of Hebrews go from man as humanity in general to man as Jesus in particular? To answer this question, we could spend much, much time on it, and I don't want to do that for the purposes of this, of this sermon, so I just want to give you a brief introduction to the answers and then leave the rest for your personal study. As um, a pastor I listen to, Alistair Begg often says, that's going to be your homework. And the, the introduction to this answer is what we need to understand is the Bible is a book comprised of many, many stories, but all of those stories comprise the single unified story of God's redemption in Jesus. So all the stories of the Bible point to and are ultimately fulfilled in the one story of redemption in Jesus. All the stories in the Bible are leading us to Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Lord of all. And in Psalm 8, we see that very thing. We see little stories pointing forward to the big story of Jesus. And what are some of these little stories? Well, in Psalm 8, we see the little stories with the words subjection or dominion and the words son of man. If you were to trace these themes, beginning in Genesis and then looking throughout all scripture, you would see that dominion and son of man is something that appears in Genesis, appears throughout the Old Testament, and then is culminated in Jesus. 
So for example, we reference Genesis 1, where God created man, male and female, in his image, and gave them dominion over all of creation. They were to be the rulers of creation on God's behalf. But then what happened? Well, it was not long before humanity, man, allowed a creature to usurp that authority. What happened? The serpent, rather than exercising dominion over it, they obeyed the serpent rather than God. And the result of their disobedience was that all of creation was subjected to futility. The reason why we experience such pain, such distress, why we experience sickness and death is because of what happened in the garden. Because Adam and Eve, humanity, man, did not exercise the dominion that God had created them for. Similarly, in the book of Daniel, we hear about a son of man. Daniel sees, and, and he records in Daniel chapter 7, one like a son of man appearing before the throne of God and receiving from him a kingdom and dominion so that he might rule over all of creation. So in Genesis, we hear about this dominion and we see humanity failing to exercise the dominion they're supposed to exercise. And then Dan in Daniel 7, we hear about this son of man who is going to exercise dominion over everything. And the question becomes, who is the one who ultimately fulfills that prophecy? As well as in Genesis 3, we hear about this promise that God's going to send a seed of the woman, a child of the woman, who would crush the head of the serpent. Who's the one who fulfills those stories? Who's the one who fulfills those promises? And the answer, the old Sunday school answer that all the kids always give, is Jesus. And it's not uh, a trite answer. It's not an answer that we should just dismiss as we often do. But it's the real, true answer that Jesus is the one who fulfills these promises. He is the one who truly exercises dominion over all things. For after his resurrection, God gave him the Father gave him dominion over all things. And he says, at the end of Matthew, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So we see Jesus being the one who fulfills these smaller stories. Because all the stories of the Bible point forward to the ultimate story found in Jesus. So that's how the writer of Hebrews can take this psalm, which seems to have been applied to to generally humanity and apply it specifically to Jesus because he is the one who fulfills the Son of Man who exercises this dominion over creation. Let's look at verses 6 through 8, which is where the author of Hebrews quotes from Psalm 8. And I just want to mention how Jesus fulfills this psalm because what, what the writer of Hebrews does is he quotes the psalm and then he explains how Jesus fulfills it. So just so we have an understanding of where the author is going, just a couple comments. Verse 6, it has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. What we're going to see is in verse 7, when he says, you've made him a little lower than the angels, that refers to the time when Jesus descended from heaven, took on flesh, and dwelt among us. So the, the word we would say is the incarnation. It refers to Jesus leaving heaven and thus become lower than the angels in the sense that his position is now on earth rather than in heaven. Though he's still God, he is now God in the flesh, fully God and fully man. Then what happened? He was made lower than the angels, but then he was crowned with glory and honor. After his resurrection, as I've already said, the Father exalted Jesus and, and, and he raised him from the dead, and then he ascended into heaven. He ascended into heaven and was thus crowned with this great glory and honor. And part of that, we see, verse 8, is that everything has been placed in subjection to him. So here is Jesus, the one who descended from heaven to come to earth, the one who then ascended from earth into heaven. 
and the one to whom God placed all things under his feet. That's what the writer of Hebrews is now going to describe for us. So, continuing in verse 8, the writer says, Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. So what we see in this verse is that every single thing has been placed in subjection to Jesus, such that there is nothing outside of his control. R.C. Sproul, if you've heard of him before, he used to say that there is no maverick molecule in all of existence because every single thing is under control, is under Jesus' control. He is the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. But, the writer then continues. He says, though it's true everything has been placed in subjection to Jesus, he says, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. So on the one hand, he says what? Everything is subjected to Jesus. He has complete control over all things. Nothing is outside of his authority. Yet on the other hand, at the present time, we do not see it. So what does this mean? It means though it is true that Jesus is reigning over all things, the world that we see is often not a world, is, oft, is, is not the world we would think we would see if Jesus was reigning. For Jesus is a king who loves righteousness and hates wickedness. He's the king who calls us to him for rest. And he's the king who brings an end to all death and mourning and crying and pain. That's the world we would expect to see. But what is the world that we see? Though Jesus is reigning over all things, the world that we often see is a world that lies under the power of the evil one. The one who seeks to kill and to steal and to destroy. And thus, the world that we see is one that's full of death and sickness and distress and loneliness and travail. You know, um, when we hear these things in the present time, the first thing that off likely comes to our mind is everything that's taking place with the coronavirus and all of the trouble it's causing us, all of the distress and difficulties, and how it's just totally disrupted our lives and even brought an end to some lives. But we could also mention all of the more common troubles that we experience in life. If you think about relational conflicts with, in, with marriages, with children, with our family members, you think about the the difficulties that we often experience in work, the loss of loved ones, the loneliness and pain that comes with old age, and on and on the list could go. In all of these ways and more, the world that we see is a world that does not appear to be subjected to Jesus' control. So the question becomes, how are we to live in light of that? We know on the one hand that Jesus is in control of all things, and yet on the other hand, we often don't see his control. So what are we to do? Well, that's what the writer of Hebrews now tells us in verse 9. So in stark contrast to what we do not see, namely, we often do not see the world in subjection to Jesus, he tells us in verse 9, what we do see. Verse 9, but we see him. So in contrast to not seeing it, meaning not seeing everything in subjection to Jesus, we see Jesus. What do we see about Jesus? He says, we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. So we see Jesus as the one who, as we've already said, left heaven to come and dwell among us. He's the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. He's the one who humbled himself by becoming human and ultimately by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We, we see, therefore, 
one who did not remain distant from our suffering. We don't see one who just stayed in heaven, separate from all that we're dealing with, and just kind of says, oh yeah, just, just try to deal with it. Instead, we see one who left his heavenly throne to, can't, to come and live among us so that he might suffer like us and suffer for us. And because Jesus suffered like us, the writer of Hebrews describes, he is our great high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows what we're going through. We can't ever say about Jesus that he doesn't understand because he understands perfectly, not only because he knows everything, but also because he experiences all of the struggles that we go through in life. He's the one who suffered like us so he can sympathize with us, but he's also the one who suffered for us. He's the one who died the death that we should have died. He's the one who suffered in our place who suffered as our substitutionary sacrifice. So, uh, so many times in the book of Hebrews, he describes how Jesus is this perfect sacrifice. He's the one who was sacrificed once for all for our sins. And he says at the end of verse 9, he, he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus died so that we would not have to die. As he says in John 11, that he is the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in him, though he die, yet shall he live. So because Jesus suffered for us, we no longer have to fear death. We no longer have to fear the condemnation of God's judgment because we know that Jesus became the curse for us. Jesus suffered like us and he suffered for us. And when we see Jesus in this way, one of the difficulties that so often comes with suffering will begin to dissolve. For when it comes to suffering, people often have a hard time accepting the real Jesus. They can come up with this Jesus that is more uh, acceptable to them, more understandable to them, but when it comes to the real Jesus, the Jesus we're seeing here, the one who is in complete control of all things, who is perfectly good, perfectly sovereign, and yet, in his great wisdom, chooses to allow evil to continue, people have a hard time accepting that. Why? Because they can't understand why Jesus would allow evil to continue if he is so sovereign, if he's in complete control. But when we see Jesus as the one who was made lower than the angels, then though our questions as to why he allows evil to continue may still remain, we will be able to have complete confidence that he is for us, that he loves us, that he will never leave us or forsake us. For when we see Jesus as the one who left heaven to come to suffer like us and for us, we will see that he has not abandoned us in our suffering, that he is not seeking our evil in this suffering, but that he has a good plan for us, that he is working all things according to the counsel of his will, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So do you see Jesus in this way? Remember this question, have you seen Jesus? Have you seen him as the one who was made lower than the angels? But second, have you seen Jesus as the one who was crowned with glory and honor? Though we do not yet see the world in subjection to Jesus, the world is no less subjected to him. He is still the King of kings and the Lord of lords who sovereignly reigns over all things. And by God's grace and through the scriptures, we can come to see Jesus as this exalted king, as the risen Lord that he is, even in the midst of the world that we live in. By God's grace, if we can set our mind upon these things, if we can call these things to mind, then we can see Jesus in this way. And I just want to read some verses for you um, to meditate upon this in this regard. So Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Acts 10, 36, Peter says that Jesus is Lord of what? Lord of all. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, Paul describes how 
The Father raised Jesus from the dead and then seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And he says, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this life, but also in the one to come. And he says that he placed all things under his feet. That is who Jesus is right now. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, again, Paul describes how after his resurrection, the Father exalted Jesus and gave him the name that is above every name. Why? So that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he is Lord. And then in Revelations, Revelation 5, 12, we hear this picture described for us. Revelation 4 of how the Father is on the throne. Revelation 5 of how the Son comes to appear before the Father. And how all of these creatures come to worship the Son and to proclaim that He is worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. That is who Jesus is right now. So though we don't see everything in subjection to Him, he is still the one who is in complete control of all things. Do you see Jesus in this way? And then last, do you see Jesus as the one to whom all things will be put in subjection, at which time every single person will know that he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. When Jesus returns, it will be evident to all without any question who is the sovereign Lord to whom all things are in subjection. Everyone will realize that Jesus is this Lord. Everyone will confess that he is Lord. And, and when he returns, he will remove from his kingdom all causes of sin. He will throw them into the lake of fire and he will welcome his people into his presence where we will reign with him forever and ever in the new heavens and the new earth, where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. So we close then with the question with which we began, and that is, have you seen Jesus? Have you ever seen Jesus? Perhaps we should ask first. You might be listening to this video and have never truly acknowledged Jesus as as Lord and never sought him as Savior. So may today be the day that you come to confess your sins, that you come to call upon Jesus to save you, and by God's grace, humbly submit yourself to him as the Lord of all. Because as we've seen, if, if you refuse, if you continue like the fools described in the Old Testament who say, Ah, God's not going to punish anything, God doesn't even exist, then when Jesus returns, he will remove you from his kingdom and forever and ever you will be judged. So may, by God's grace, you seek Jesus today as Savior and Lord. But then for those of us who have seen Jesus, the question is, are we daily seeing Jesus? in the midst of this world in which we do not see everything in subjection to him? Are we seeing him? Are we beholding him daily as Savior and Lord? Because seeing Jesus in this way isn't something that's just a one-time action. It's not as if we, we see Jesus as Savior and Lord and then we go on our life and do whatever we so please, instead, seeing Jesus is something that is to be our constant pursuit. The writer of Hebrews describes in chapter 12, he says, chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Looking to Jesus, considering Jesus, is something that is to be a constant pursuit for us. 
So, again, have you seen Jesus? And as I said before, may this question not just be something you remember, but may this question, may these meditations drive you to daily seek Jesus through his word. Because though we cannot physically see Jesus now, we can truly see him, we can truly behold him through his word. So may God give us the grace we need to seek him, to seek his son daily through his word, by, by reading his word, by memorizing his word, by meditating on his word, by obeying his word. Because what all of us need is to see Jesus more and more. And by God's grace, it can be the case that we can truly have Psalm 73 be the, the words that flow out of our heart. So we'll close with these verses from Psalm 73. One of my favorite verse, one of my favorite passages here. 73, 23 through 36, where Asaph the author says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to what? To glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So in this world in which so many things can fail, and we're seeing that again and again with this virus, and we'll see it again and again throughout our life. Our flesh and our heart may fail. Things so important to us, so essential to our life, may fail us. But in those times when we see Jesus, we will realize that he is the strength of our heart and our portion forever. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the fact that you are sovereignly reigning over all things. That in this world that can seem so chaotic, so uncertain, we can rest in the fact that you are King of kings and you are Lord of lords. May you help us to seek you. Father, grant us grace by your Spirit to behold your glory in the face of your Son through your word, that we would daily be able to say, I have seen Jesus today, and my heart is satisfied in him. May you be glorified in us above all things, and we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, may God's grace be with you, and I can't wait till I can actually see you face to face, and this isn't just an empty room, but people are back here. The church is back in in this building. So God's grace be with you till then.